started. So if you guys want to find a seat and welcome to our Wednesday praise and prayer service. We still have some expensive seats up front. So we're going to um, do what we do on Wednesdays. We're going to do some worship together. And then we're going to continue with our study on the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, then we'll have some prayer, which is really important. So we're uh, happy to have you here this evening. A great place to spend your Wednesday evenings. We want to pray and ask God to uh, invade this place with His presence and to have His Holy Spirit lead us in what we do. Um, I'm going to encourage you to pray and pray some more as we continue through the days and the months before Jesus comes back. A whole lot of stuff happening in the world, right? Incredible. Spiraling out of control in one way and spiraling, as Pastor John says, in control in another way, right? Coming together. And it's amazing what we're seeing so quickly uh, it's hard to even keep up with the events of the day. But we're thankful again that we have God's word. We have his promises. And uh, we're going home soon. That's wonderful. We're looking forward to that, huh? Amen. Amen. That'll be good. So let's go ahead and pray. And let's ask God to um, bless our time together as we, as we worship him and thank him for his goodness and his faithfulness. We're so overwhelmed, Father, that you would choose us from the foundations of the world. Hard to even believe that that could happen, but we know ourselves, God, we know there's nothing good in us, but you're good to us, and you reached out, and you wooed us into the kingdom of God. I'm so thankful for the work of your Holy Spirit. Uh, we convicted us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And for all those people, Father, who are instrumental in our life, who are faithful to present the gospel, who are faithful to continue in our lives when we refused or turned away, I thank you, Father, for the hope we have. As we look at the outside, God, it's dark. But as we look up, God, it's nothing but light. And we thank you for that. And now, Father, we pray as we worship you, these are songs, God, to express from our heart your goodness to us. Thank you, God, again, for your work in each life here tonight. And we continue to pray for your Holy Spirit to mold us and to make us into that very image of Christ. How we thank you for your faithfulness, God, your persistence in our life. We want to bless you this evening, God, by just saying thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name. Amen.
You are.
before acknowledging you, God, tonight, that we need you. And we need you now, Lord. We need you now so much, God, especially in these days, God. And Father, we're just calling out to you that you would send the Lord of Heaven's armies, your angels, God, to be here with us now in this place, Father God, that as we hear from you today, that our hearts, God, would be open, our minds open, and that we would just be willing to just bask in your love tonight, Father God, just hearing from you whatever it is that we need to hear, God. Whatever we've come in with, we just want to lay it down right now. And uh, just ask, God, that you minister into us, Lord God, as we minister out, Father God. Lord, we love you. There is no other love like your love, Lord God. So, Father, just come. Come, thou fount of every blessing.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for, for just pouring out your spirit in this place tonight, Lord God. We, we humble ourselves before you, and, and we are grateful, Lord. We praise your holy name, and we thank you for, for who you are, for who you are in truth, for who you are in our lives, Lord God. We thank you for your promises. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, Lord God. Father, I just pray that we would um, consider the boldness that you would instill in us and just take it, Lord God. And to be fearless in these battles, Father. <coughs> Father, we follow you. And we know, we know that we may get burned, Father, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna lose this one, Lord. Father, we will be with you in victory, in eternity. And we are just extremely grateful, Lord God. Yeah. <coughs> and I remember how you told me that life may not be easy and everything I need you've already given me. And I remember how you told me that I can trust you completely. So why am I doubting when you prove that you'd fight for me? You've walked me through changed by your mercy and covered by your peace I'm living out the victory doesn't mean I won't feel the heat you've walked me through of my redemption and Lord how could I question when you proved that you died for me you've walked me through fire Thank you, Jesus, that you are faithful in all things. 
and there's a lot of the moments in between all the monumental ones. There's some, there's some amazing things that we can look back on in our lives and see how, how great you've been, the way that you've rescued us, the way that you've, you've salvaged things and, and created new in our lives, God. But there's a lot of those moments in between that, um, that we forget about, God. We read about the great heroes of the Bible and these events that happened, these, these things that are extraordinary, God, and we forget about the time that they spent in, in prison or in the desert or, mm. or wandering and, and, and how they must have felt all the same things that we feel, God, but they didn't let go of their faith. Mm. And so, God, we cling to you today and, and realize that we live in, in very uh, tumultuous times, times that are uncertain, times that uh, create a lot of havoc in our lives, God, and in the lives around us, but we know that we can rest in you. We thank you for that. We thank you for your faithfulness.
All right. Everybody have a good day? Yes. A good day? Yes. A good day. <laughs> okay. Wonderful, Wonderful day. A God blessed day. day. Oh, man, we're getting all kinds of adjectives. Anyway, good to see you guys. We're going to continue our study on the gifts. Let's go ahead and pray one more time. Father, thank you that we can come. And right now, Father, we want to open our minds, God, to your word and to what you have for us. And we're so grateful that you give us direction in life. Oh, thankful we didn't have to figure it out ourselves. But you gave us all that we need, as your word says, for life and godliness. And now as we look, Father, at your word in this incredible passage of the gifts of the Spirit, I pray, Father, instill in us the truths that we need to further your kingdom and to bless you and to bless others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're, um, this particular um, passage is entitled The Foundational Gifts. You'll find out in a little bit. Um, last time we met, uh, this installment of the gifts of the Spirit, I ended this statement. I used this statement. The effectiveness of a sent Bible church will be directly related to how each member exercises their God-given spiritual gifts. These are spiritual tools that God has given us um, to help bring us to maturity and really to further the gospel of Christ in our community and really throughout the world. But it's amazing when you consider all the information that's out there on how to grow a church. I typed in um, this week how to grow a church on Google. I got as many as 24 million hits to as many as uh, 200 million hits on how to grow a church. Everything from seminars to books to really bizarre uh, activities that draw people, that they do to draw people into the church. Let me give you some um, examples. In an effort to reach unchurched rednecks, in Kentucky Baptist Convention, they hosted the second... <laughs> There may be some in the audience, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Second Amendment celebrations during which churches served steak and gave away guns at the door. <laughs> Chuck McAllister, former pastor and traveling evangelist who presided over the events, called his strategy affinity evangelism because it used a common interest to attract potential converts and turn them into a community. <laughs> Here's another one. This is choice. In a sermon series on doing what others say is impossible, Pastor Grambling from the Florida Church teamed up with a stunt man named Mike Busey, better known as Mr. Dizzy. And they advertised this as a legitimately explosive illustration. So as their cheering congregation and invited guests looked on, the pastor sat in a car that was blown up, and he escaped unscathed. That was used to attract people. Unbelievable. What does God tell us about growing the church? Pretty simple, doesn't it? Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said this, Upon what? This rock I'll build my church. And so much what is out there is gimmicks, and it's shortcuts, all to be part of this big movement called a megachurch, right? Megachurches. That's the big push today in churches. And really what's coming out of our seminaries is appalling. I don't know if you're familiar with what's happening in our seminaries across the country. Union Theological Seminary was founded in 1836. And when they began, it was founded on the fact that God's word was infallible. But I got to tell you where it's gone from there. Um, there is a lady there who is the president of the seminary, Susan Ser Serene Jones. She doesn't believe in the resurrection, doesn't believe in the virgin birth, doesn't really believe in prayer. Theirs is a social gospel. Just go out and try and make the world better as they can. It's a little frightening what's happening. All these seminaries that were founded on the Word of God have now moved into a place that the gospel and the Word of God is no longer even recognizable. 
Ephesians 4.11 says this. This is the blueprint God has given us as a church. To build God's church, God's way. And it employs foundational gifts is to spiritually mature believers and to continue God's plan as Jesus uh, returns. And this is what it says. He gave some as apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. So we're going to be looking at really the first one, the apostles, in just a few minutes, because we're going to go one by one over the next number of months. But we need to review just a little bit of where we've been so we can find out where we're going. We began um, this study um, a few months ago on um, the gifts of the Spirit by first turning our attention to the gift giver. And we talked about how significant the Holy Spirit is, and it can't really be overstated how important the Holy Spirit is in our life. He's there at our birth, right? And He's involved with our growing up and maturing, right? And He's there to deliver us home, right? He's involved with everything about who we are. And so it's very significant we understand the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And then in our second study, we looked at why Paul needed to write three chapters on the gifts of the Spirit. It was because of turmoil, right, in the church. They were abusing the uh, gifts. They were ignorant of the gifts. And this church had been led astray by false teaching and pagan influence. And by the way, the problem's increasing today. 2 Timothy 4.3 says this, For a time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away, from, away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And there's a whole lot of teachers out there that know how to fix those itching ears. There's one in Texas specifically. It's got a big old church. You guys familiar with Joel Olstein? Yeah. These are some of the books that he's written. The Power of the I Am. The I Am is not God he's speaking about. The I Am is here. Another book is I Declare. Not God declares, I declare. Another book he wrote, Your, Your Greatness is Coming. <laughs> this is what people are listening to today. It's, um, it's called a flesh gospel to make you feel good about yourself. Well, our last study, um, we addressed some common questions about the spiritual gifts. We looked at what is a spiritual gift, who gives the spiritual gifts, what is the difference between the spiritual gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. We looked at how to recognize spiritual gifts. But now we're going to turn our attention to the foundational gifts. These are these main pillars that God has given the church. And before we examine those, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, because there's a couple of things here we need to look at before we move into the gifts that are very significant. And the Apostle Paul here is going to remind the church of a truth that should be demonstrated anytime spiritual gifts are expressed. The foundational truth that Paul's going to drive home about the outcome of biblical practice of spiritual gifts is very simply this. There has to be unity through diversity. Unity through diversity. And it should be evident. And the way that Paul presents it is very unique. He uses the example of the triune God, the Trinity, the activity and the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So look at verses 4 through 6. And I want you to look at some phrases that are repeated through those verses. It says, diversity of gifts, do you see this? But the same spirit. See that? Mm -hmm. Then it talks about the differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And then it talks about diversity of operations, but the same God. Do you see the Trinity there? He's tying it all together. That together they accomplish one goal. So the gifts of the spirit are distinct, they're varied, but united in one purpose. So the biblical practice of the gift should never, never divide a church. So whenever you see the practice of the gifts taking place and there's division in the church, something's wrong and it's not God. Three things that Paul brings up about these gifts in verses 4 through 6. 
First of all, he talks about diversity of gifts, okay? There are three specific places in the New Testament where spiritual gifts are identified. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and 1 Peter 4.10. Some have identified as many as 26 spiritual gifts. We don't know. People, there's all kinds of things out there talking about how to number the gifts. I don't think that's all that important. I don't think that's an exhaustive gift that you go through the scripture. I don't think it's terribly exhaustive. Why so many gifts are needed? Why did God give so many gifts to the church? Well, it's the same reason that you need a whole lot of gifted people to build your house, right? You can hire an electrician, but I wouldn't uh, have him do the concrete work. I don't think that's a good idea. You need a lot of people to build a house properly, right? You need electricians, you need plumbers, you need roofers, painters, carpenters. Do you guys realize that you're called a laborer of God? That you've been called to build God's house? 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 11 says this, According to the grace of God which has been given to me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another is building upon it. That's you. But let every man take heed how he buildeth upon it, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. We all have a general calling. It's called the Great Commission, right? We're all supposed to go out into the world and evangelize the world, bring people to Christ and teach them to obey. But each of us also has a very specific calling, I believe. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And look what he says, Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Do you realize that before you were saved, God had a plan for your life? Isn't that amazing? He had something very specific for you to do. There are some general things we all do, but there's something very specific God wants you to do in your life for him. Some have been called by God to be pastor teachers, some people missionaries, administrators, exhorters, the gift of giving, mercy, discernment. There's a whole bunch of different gifts that God has given us. But when spiritual gifts are examined in the New Testament, it's evident gifts can be combined. Think about the Apostle Paul. Do you think Paul had more than one gift? Oh boy, did he ever, right? He was an apostle, that's one gift already. Was he a teacher? Pastor? Exhorter, gift of mercy, you go down the list, right? So we don't have to lock in and say, I just have one gift. I don't think that's the way it works. I think God combines things in our life with the different gifts. Well, here's the third thing that Paul says about the gifts. That there's a diversity of operation, diversity of operation, but the same God which worketh all in all. The word operation is the word energama, which means power or referring to God's enablement. Any gift can be expressed in various ways. For instance, teaching. Now, we know teaching mainly in the church right here, right? Either from the pulpit, generally, Sunday school, children's ministry. But can teaching be done elsewhere? Uh, in all kinds of different ways, right? Writing books. You realize that when we sing worship songs that we're teaching through that? We're giving you theology through the music. So when you look at a particular gift, it's like a diamond. It's got all kinds of facets that God wants to use. But before uh, turn, Paul turns his attention to specific gifts, he, he reminds the church of the purpose of the gifts in verses 4 through 6 by saying this. He ends this way. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. What's he saying about that? He says, every spiritual gift is for the building up of the whole body of Christ to the benefit of all. There's one other thing he's saying in that whole thing. It's not for personal edification. Do you realize that? Your gifts are not for you. The gifts that God has given you is for blessing somebody else. So there's no such thing as personal edification to the gift. So now we're going to turn our attention to the specific gifts. And we're going to study the spiritual gifts in the months to come in kind of three categories, so you'll know. We're going to look at the foundational gifts. We're going to look at the permanent gifts. And we're going to be looking at some which I think are temporary sign gifts. We'll look at that as time goes on. So we have a lot of months ahead of us to cover this. Well, the description of the foundational gifts are found in verses 4 
Ephesians 4, 11. And it kind of extends to verse 16. This is a passage you guys have heard over and over, I hope. You've been listening, Pastor John. That really is the basis and the destiny of uh, Ascent Bible Church. Because the growth both in number and depth of any church is really directly dependent on understanding and the implementation of the foundational gifts. So what are the foundational gifts? These are spiritual gifts that were essential in the establishment of the early church. And what's really interesting, what sets these gifts a little bit apart from the ones you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Romans 12, these were, given from the, these were given by the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the other ones given by the Holy Spirit. But you look at these ones here, these were given by the Lord Jesus Christ. The chronological order of these gifts, I think, are very significant. When you read the scripture, chronology is really important, the way that God lays out his word. And he, he lays it out very simply. First of all, there's got to be apostles. What do apostles do? We're going to find out. They establish the work. They're the first ones to establish the work. But along comes the prophets who foretell, for bring forth the word of God. Evangelists are necessary to build a church, right? Get out the word of God. And then we need pastor teachers to build the church itself. Well, the apostles, we're going to see in a moment, were the sent out ones. That's really what the word means. And the initial 12 were commissioned by Jesus himself to initiate the establishment of the church of Christ. The three other um, foundational gifts we'll look at, again, are prophets, and evangelists, and pastor teachers, declaring the word, reaching the, the lost, and establishing those who are saved. Now, notice, again, the designations uh, that are involved all involved in some way of proclaiming the Word of God, because it's the Word of God that brings people to relationship with God. It's the Word of God that builds spiritual life into people. So first on the list is apostles. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever met an apostle? Nobody met an apostle? You know, considering the vast number of people today who have laid claim of this highest biblical office. If you've not met one, you're going to hear about them. There's plenty of them out there. You know, it's an important question we need to consider when we look at this whole idea of apostles. And here's the question. Has the apostolic office truly continued throughout church history till today? Or have these modern day apostles taken authority that does not belong to them? And we're going to be looking at that. You'll, I hope you'll come to a conclusion at the end of this. So, um, there's a new movement. Well, it's not actually new, but it's emerging again. It's called the uh, New Apostolic Reformation. It was founded by Peter Wagner back in 1996 at Fuller Seminary. And it contends that we are living in the second apostolic age of the church, in which they believe that they have the same authority over the church as the New Testament apostles did. And there are some very interesting things that they're doing that are not biblical. You know, as in every claim, it doesn't matter what somebody thinks. What matters what is the Bible, what the Bible reveals, right? And God has revealed what all we need to know about the office of apostle. In fact, the word apostle is not just a generic term for the church to throw on and, uh, and apply it as it wishes. Do titles have meanings? Do they? Titles have meanings, don't they? Yes. They communicate authority and position, mm -hmm. and they depend on certain credentials. Like, for instance, you may want to be a doctor, but because you put a white jacket on with a stethoscope doesn't make you one, <laughs> right? You may have a video game that shows you how to fly an airplane on a video, but because you go find a captain's suit and the captain's hat, you shouldn't get on that 747. <laughs> you really shouldn't. It's not good for anyone. We can't assume any legitimate authority by self-applying titles. So, so let me give you a, a Jeopardy question, since we're talking about apostles. Who was the first apostle? Anybody know? 
Think Peter? Listen to this. Hebrews 3.1 Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Isn't that interesting? You know what's interesting about it is just the word apostle. You know what the word apostle means? We talked about it a moment ago. It means just sent one. He was sent by God, wasn't he? He's the sent one. And he is the apostle, capital T-H-E, capital A-P-O-S-T-L-E. He's the, all capital letters. He is the apostle. But then there were the 14 apostles. In Matthew 10, 2, it says this. Now, name, the name of the apostles are, and he names all the apostles, at least the 12 there. And the 12 became more than just messengers. Jesus bestowed on them an official title, a position, and later Matthias replaced Judas. Remember that? So when, I look, when you look at 14 going, what is he talking about? <laughs> there were 14. Judas exited, right? Matthias took his place, and then we find out that Paul was also called an apostle. So there were 14 total. So again, what is an apostle? We have to get this, make make sure we get this one straight. It's someone sent off on a commission to do something as one's personal representative with credentials furnished. They got to have those things. An apostle could be easily translated this way, an ambassador, someone who goes on a mission bearing credentials of the one who sent him. So how did the apostles come to be? That's always a good question, right? How did they come to to be? Did they apply a self-applying title to themselves like they do today? Were they required to submit an application or letters of recommendation? Or did they have to take a test? It was none of that. Instead, the 12, were, listen carefully, were personally chosen and commissioned by Jesus. That's what set them apart. From all these other claims that people have, these ones were personally chosen and commissioned by Jesus. And what was their commission? Well, in the broadest description of the description of what they did, the spiritual gift of the apostle was to divinely, give them a divine ability to establish and oversee the development of the first century church. And with that gift, God gave them certain enablements. Mark chapter 3 Verses 14 and 15 records the ordination of the 12 apostles. And listen what God, what Jesus did. He says he ordained the 12, that they should be with him, and that he might send them, the word send is apostle, send them forth to do three things, to preach, to heal, and to cast out devils. Those are some of the enablements that God gave these apostles. We're going to look in the days ahead, the months ahead. We're going to look at some of these very specific things because we're definitely going to be looking at the gift of healing. And we're going to look at the the gift of miracles, which is going to encompass this idea of casting out devils. So we'll look at that in the days to come. So miraculous signs, healing, casting out of devils was, listen carefully, this is critical was to authenticate the apostles' authority and authenticate the message. That's what it was for. The problem we have is we look at the the miracle, not understanding what the miracle's for. The purpose of miraculous signs were just that, signs that pointed to something, and this was the kingdom of God was at hand. We look at Jesus' miracles, and they're incredible, weren't they? Oh, my goodness. Miracle after miracle. What were the miracles for? Were they primarily to heal somebody because they were sick or had an ailment? Was that the primary reason for it? No, it was not. The primary reason for the miracle was to get their attention that something divine was happening, that they needed to listen to a message. is to authenticate the messenger, who was Jesus, that he was divine. We need to remember the audience of the early church. It's real important when you study the scripture. Pastor John's mentioned so often how to study the Bible. When you study the scripture, you've got to find out who's the audience. Who's he speaking to? Who was the early church? Who, who was Jesus speaking to when he is ministering to? Was it Gentiles? Not really. 
There were a few that came around, right? But who was it primarily? The Jews, right? It was the Jews that he was speaking to. And what did Jesus say about the Jews? What did they need? They needed signs. Did they have signs? Did the Jewish history have signs? Oh my goodness. Read, look at the Old Testament. Sign after sign after sign after sign after sign. Did it do much for them? Did it save them? Nope. How many people went into this promised land? <laughs> Not all those people who saw the signs. And there are plenty that Moses did, right? Jesus speaks about the Jews this way. An evil and adulterous generation that seeks for a sign. How are we to walk as believers? Looking for signs? We walk by what? Faith, not by sight. How many times have you heard, maybe you even said this, if I could only see a sign, I'd believe. I hear it all the time. I hear people tell me that. If God gives me a sign, then I'll believe. I said, no, you won't. The signs are just to point to something. There's a great passage in 1 Kings chapter 17. This is a story about Elijah. You remember that story? God calls him to go visit this widow. And um, he helps her with some food miraculously. But there's the problem in the house. The little boy dies. Remember that? And God gives Elijah the power to resurrect him, basically. Bring him back from the dead. And here's the conclusion to the, what happened. In 1 Kings 17, 24, when it was all done, it says, and the woman said to Elijah, and I want you to look at the way he, she understands what this whole thing was about. By this, in other words, bringing her son back from the dead. By this, I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth. Is the word of the, the, and the word of the Lord is in thy, is, is in thy mouth is truth. The miracle was to validate the messenger to listen to the truth of God. Acts 14.3 summarizes the purpose of signs and wonders. This is what it says about the apostles. Long time therefore abode they, the apostles, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The signs and wonders were not the issue the issue was what they had to say was the word of God. One other thing that the apostles had that no one else had, they were marked out with revelatory ministry. In other words, they had received direct revelation from God and they were inspired to write it down, which we have now in the scriptures, the infallible accuracy of the scripture. Jesus told his disciples in John 16, 13, the spirit of truth will come and he'll do what? He'll guide you into all truth, all truth. The apostle John gives us further insight into the qualifications of the apostles. In 1 John 1, 1, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon with our own hands, we've handled the word of life. He's talking about what the apostles were experienced. And when the apostles met in, first, in Acts chapter 1, 21 through 22, to replace Judas, this is what Peter described as the qualifications of an apostle. Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the beginning of the baptism of John, unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. What's he doing? He's setting out the qualifications for an apostle. So how can we summarize the qualification for an apostle? The reason we're kind of hammering this down is because what's going on in the world today with this apostolic movement, you've got to be very aware of what's happening with that movement. Here's how you can summarize the qualifications for apostles. They were personally chosen by Jesus. They were personally commissioned by Jesus. They were personally empowered by Jesus. They were personally with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. They were personally witnessed his resurrection, personally given direct revelation. I hope you're coming to conclusion. Are there any apostles today? I don't think so. 
So we asked the question earlier, has the apostolic office truly continued throughout church history till today, or have these modern day apostles usurped their authority that does not belong to them? And from the study, I think of God's word, we can answer no and yes. So by considering the definition of apostle, there is no continuance of the apostolic office. And yes, by definition, these modern day self-appointed apostles have usurped their authority that does not belong to them. This should be significant for those of you who came from a Roman Catholic background. I did. I was taught that there's apostolic succession, bolstered by this Petrine theory, which claims that Jesus designated Peter to be his representative on earth and the leader of the church, out of Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, and they point to Peter as the rock. There's only rock, one rock I know in Scripture, and it's not Peter. Peter is um, understood as having been the first pope, and then the papacy itself is believed to be continuous line of apostolic succession. And when the pope speaks from the chair ex cathedra, it means that anything he speaks on faith and morals is as much as scripture. If you read history, uh, you'd be shocked. <laughs> Totally shocked, and I'd encourage you to read history of what happened in the church. There's a glaring problem because other than Peter, none of the succeeding popes meet the biblical requirement for biblical apostleship. So since the spiritual gift of the office of apostleship has ceased, we cannot insist, as some, there's charismatics, and this is really where it's coming from, that all spiritual gifts described in the New Testament continue as they do today. There are some gifts, I believe, have ceased. This is one of them. It's hard to argue that it continues at this point. So what about those New Testament verses that call other people apostles other than the 12? You probably read that, haven't you? Gone through the scripture and seen there's other people that are designated as apostles. Do you remember the definition of an apostle? What is it? Sent out, right? Sent out. After the church is established in Acts chapter 2, there were many individuals sent out to carry out the gospel to the unsaved. 2 Corinthians 8.23, it talks about them being messengers of the churches, sent out by the churches, which is a little bit different than the apostles who were sent out by Jesus himself. There, there were major and there were minor characters called apostles. Barnabas was called an apostle. James, the Lord's brother, was called an apostle. Paphroditus was called an apostle. There, there are several others in the scripture that were called apostles. That's the small a, not capital A. These are the you guys remember, anybody played basketball years ago when they had the A squad and the B squad? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what it is. You have the A, the A apostles, <laughs> and then you have the others. So, um, in a broad sense, can we as believers accomplish apostolic work through evangelism? Yes, right? Are you sent? Are, should you be sent? Every Sunday... John says, look at the door there. You're entering your mission field. You're out, what? Being sent out, right? To do God's work. But unfortunately, that's not what some modern leaders mean when they lay claim to apostolic office because they claim the authority, the privilege, and the power that it really isn't theirs. So apart from understanding that the spiritual gift of the office apostle has ceased, is there anything else we can apply from this gift of apostleship? Absolutely. That's again in Matthew 28, 19. Here's what it says. And Jesus came and spake unto them and saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all, that, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. 
That is your call. You can practice apostolic gift by going out and evangelizing, being sent out. But I do want you to know what's going on in the world today. It's so significant that the, the office of apostle was very specific with very specific qualifications. But be so aware of the movements that are taking place today. They are dangerous and they're drawing people into some very false teaching that will just absolutely destroy a person's life. So what we're going to do now, we're going to gather together and pray. And we do need to pray, right? There's so many things that are in our hearts relative to our own personal needs. There's needs in the church, and we're asking, the leadership is asking you very, um, with all our hearts, that you pray for the leadership for wisdom in the days ahead of some of the things that are going on. We need wisdom and know how to manage the changes that are taking place in the world today and how they are affecting the church. It's very significant. So what we want you to do now is just to kind of gather in groups of maybe six or eight, and then let's go ahead and spend some time in uh, prayer.